Good morning. Welcome here. If uh, you're just getting settled in and you find you don't have a key yet, then don't get too settled in. You should grab one or ushers will bring one to you. So uh, you, can, you can hear the jingle of Santa Claus coming. Uh, if you don't have a key, put your hand up maybe and I'll uh, get a key to you that way. Uh, it'll just be part of the, the, the message and uh, the take home this morning. So make sure you have one of those. Uh, one, one, two announcements this morning. One is that Operation Christmas Child is coming up. We have boxes probably in the foyer that you can fill. Uh, there you go. Bring them back. So you guys kind of know the drill with that, I think, right? Uh, neat opportunity to do something with, uh, your, with your family as well. Uh, I always find that I don't know what to buy people that I don't really know, but if you think about someone that you know in that certain age group, maybe that gives you a bit of a better reference point for uh, what to get for someone when you're filling one of those boxes. Uh, one other announcement, Julia has an, uh, Julia, Julie has an announcement, <laughs> and uh, you can call her Julia, that's the name her parents gave her. Good morning. <laughs> um, okay, so I... I am starting something new this year, and I did do this announcement a couple of weeks ago, but I just thought since we're kind of into the school year, I'd do it again, just as a bit of a reminder. Um, I, I want to, there's this organization called Moms in Prayer International, and so what I'd like to do is kind of join up with that and um, invite you to join me in praying for our uh, staff and students at Elm Creek School or wherever your kids go to school. Um, so this will be every first Sunday of first Sunday of every month. Uh, downstairs, we actually have our prayer room. So we'll meet there um, just during the Sunday school hour at 9.30, um, first Sunday of every month. So I just really like this call to prayer from, from their um, post earlier this year. And so I'm just going to read that for us today. Um, and when I say moms in prayer, I, it's kind of loose. It's, yes, it's for moms, but for anyone that wants to pray for our staff and students, okay? So if you're a dad or an uncle or a neighbor or a grandma, please, please join us. This is not exclusive. Um, so it says, Dear Praying Mom, a new school year has begun and our children and schools are in desperate need of our prayers. And that is, that is true. We all know that. God has given us this divine moment to impact children and schools for Christ worldwide as we gather together and pray. Since the beginning of time, the enemy has been after the hearts, minds, and souls of the children of God. Just look at the Garden of Eden and throughout the pages of history. There is nothing new under the sun. Yet when God wants to change the course that history will take on its own, he looks for an intercessor on whose heart he can place his will. God raised up Abraham, Moses, Esther, and others so they could fulfill the great destiny he created them for, and our time is now. The children of the world were placed in this period of time for a God-sized calling, and they too will fulfill their great destiny as we pray together. In Ephesians 6, God tells us our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is a spiritual battle. He tells us to put on the full armor of God, and then he says, pray, not slay, but pray. Think about this. Prayer is the most aggressive, proactive, offensive, invasive action one can take in any situation. Prayer reaches into the spiritual realm and unleashes God's power to do his will. It opens up the eyes and turns many from darkness to his glorious light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. It brings revival and spiritual awakening. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 and 5 says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So whether the students are in preschool, private, public, homeschool, or any other school, they need our prayers. And ladies, or everybody else in this room, you are not standing alone. You're standing with God and with 10, 000, tens of thousands of people throughout the United States and in over 160 countries worldwide. God is up to something amazing. So join me in this prayer today. God Almighty, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You have created these children for this period of time. Father, we are your daughters and sons, and we ask that you will work through us. May you pour forth your power so that more children in schools can be covered in prayer. We pray that we will witness one of the greatest revivals and spiritual awakenings that we have ever seen, that this generation will be the most prayed-for generation. 
Lord, protect them from the evil ones so they may fulfill the great destiny you have for them and bring glory to your name alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, as we uh, continue on this morning, you can see that this service is looking a little bit different than uh, some other ones. We're going to have communion later on, if you haven't pieced that together, and uh, we're not having uh, worship with music this morning in uh, the way that we often do, but uh, another way to focus on God and uh, reflect and think in that way as well. Uh, before we move into that, I just wanted to feel like I'm up here, so I might as well gave me a mic. Um, <clears throat> A lot of times we, we do stuff with, with uh, students and, uh, and, and they know what's going on because they come and their families probably kind of know what's going on and if you're maybe an aunt and uncle or grandparent, you maybe know a little bit what's going on, but sometimes I realize that a lot of it goes under the radar of what, what's happening and so we, we're kind of a month and a half to two months into our, uh, our regular sort of schedule calendar this year and, uh, and in that thought of prayer as well, um, if, you're, if you find yourself just sitting there thinking like, man, I just wish I knew what to pray for, uh, then, uh, then I got some things you could pray for. Uh, I just really encourage you to pray for our, our younger group, Doc 68, uh, our grades 6 to 8. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we, we, it, it's really high energy, and it's fun to be together. Uh, it takes a lot of, I would say this year, a lot of focused and dedicated attention in certain areas too. It's a big group, so it takes a bit of, like, people can kind of slip through the cracks or we want to be mindful of them all. Like, to give you an idea, our average attendance for that this year is like 35 to 40. Like, it's a big group. So just, we, when we have people, we have awesome people helping and leading with this group. But please pray. Like, it's, it's, it's a tough one sometimes. So just invite you to pray uh, for that group and uh, for the leaders as uh, we... We, we try to lead, and uh, like I said, it's fun. It's, it's a fun group, uh, and we get the opportunity to dive into what's in the Bible and what, uh, what Jesus taught, and we get to teach that as well, which is I just love that we see new kids coming in, and we get to tell them about Jesus, and they keep coming back, and some don't, and whatever. It's great. Uh, so that's, that, that, that is that group. And then the older group, we, uh, grade 9 to 12s, we, we, we press on. And uh, it's a really fun group as well, a really capable group. I would say that very much of you guys, like very high-capacity individuals that are, uh, are helping us make that program awesome. Uh, and so one of the things recently, very recently, 12 hours ago, yesterday we were out in uh, Steinbeck. <laughs> and... Uh, we, uh, the Steinbeck Bible College hosted an event out there, uh, a whole day thing, so we kind of had a churchy service thing to start with, and then an afternoon of uh, challenges that different camps and other organizations brought, little kind of like five to 15 minute challenges at the Mennonite Heritage Village. We went around with our teams, it was super fun, it was cold, uh, but we had a good time there and uh, finished off with, uh, again, another worship service and teaching and then a concert as well, which was, uh, which was pretty cool. So that's uh, just some of the things that are happening. And, and if you find yourself as a techie person to... No, that's actually not going to work. I was going to say follow along on Instagram. You'll see what we're doing. Maybe not what we did. You'll see what's coming up anyways. So things to invite you to pray for as well is those groups. There's, uh, those are big times in life. You guys remember that from when you were there. Of, uh, there's a lot you're growing and learning in and a lot of development in that time. So I invite you to pray for our students and the, the ones that lead them as well. As we carry on here, let me pray for us and uh, as a group here, and we'll, we'll keep moving along. Heavenly Father, you are good. You're the reason we gather here. Without what you have done throughout history, without Jesus, we wouldn't be here. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love for us, the sacrifice that you made for us, the good life that you want for us. Pray that you would guide us into that, knowing that it won't always be easy, but it is good. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would uh, empower us for the work that you would have us do. To show your love to our neighbors, to show your good gospel and your good news to those around us. I pray, God, for those that are, are hurting, that are needing uh, your Holy Spirit as a comforter this morning. I pray that you would be especially present in these moments. Bind us together, God. Bind us together in love that we would, in unity, uh, be able to put you on display in a fantastic way. Thank you, God, for all you do for us. 
And even without that, you are worthy, you are worth it, and we give you the glory and the credit. Guide us along this morning, this week. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. Where do you need some good news? all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. What loss are you mourning? <coughs> they will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them though they have been deserted for many generations. Foreigners will be your servants. They will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. What brings you joy these days? For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be recognized and honored among the nations. Everyone will realize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. What does God's blessing look like? I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dr dressed me with a clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring with plants springing up everywhere. How can you praise God this week? Let your kingdom come here, let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater, you alone are Savior, show the
So this morning, uh, we're starting Children's Church for kids that are ages 2 to kindergarten. So I invite those kids who are um, off to Children's Church, if you want to come to the front, parents, hopefully you have signed uh, your kids in. If not, there is a table just outside these doors uh, to your left with a clipboard and uh, uh, some uh, numbers that you can... Um, print or take so that you register your kids if you want to, kids want to have a seat on the stairs so before these kids head off we want to pray for them so will you bow with me as we pray heavenly father we thank you for these kids uh, we know from your word uh, jesus that you love them dearly and you long for them to know you and so as they head off to uh, their time together, uh, thank you for uh, Miss Sherry as she will lead them and teach them. Uh, thank you for her willingness to do this. And we pray for the kids that they would uh, know how much you love them and the opportunity that you invite them into to knowing you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go. Well, you can turn in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 18 is where we are this morning. As Scott mentioned earlier, hopefully uh, you uh, got a key when you walked in. If not, um, this is sort of that moment to maybe raise your hand and uh, the, uh, one of the ushers will uh, bring you that key. Um, and uh, I know a few people were already asking, like, what's the key about? Just wait. You'll, you'll find out all in good time. So we're in the middle of a teaching series called This is the Way, where we're learning what it means to follow Jesus. What does it look like for you and I to be a follower, a learner, a student? Uh, one of the word, the, the word disciple is really about being a follower, a learner of Jesus. And one of the things that we said early on in the series is that sometimes with, if we just understand a disciple as a learner, it sort of has this idea of you're sitting in a class and if you've, you know, if you're still in school or if you went to university, you kind of have this understanding of, you, you know, you sit in a class and you take notes and, and then you kind of gain some knowledge and, and retain that for the, the test at the end and then you go on. Uh, I know in, in my university and, and seminary education that like there are a few classes I took where it was kind of like that was the easy credit you, you needed a, some electives, right? And so you kind of sometimes chose the really easy courses. Um, like when I was in college, I took an outdoor ed class. And um, I had no plans on teach, ever teaching outdoor education. But I knew it would be a really easy class. And so I took it. It was, you know, three easy credits. Have I ever used what I learned in outdoor ed? I'm not sure I have, right? And sometimes we just sort of take classes and it's, you go to class, you take notes, retain some knowledge for the test, and then you just come back the next week and start the cycle over again. But it never really becomes life-changing or impactful. It's not something you actually end up using in life. And the danger is that we can view following Jesus, being a student of Jesus in the same way. We come to church and we listen to a lecture for 30 minutes. We might Take some notes if you're the kind of person who takes notes. And you put the piece of paper in your Bible and you go home and you know, oh, that was kind of, yeah, that, that was good. And you might not reflect back on those notes until you stumble across that piece of paper stuck in your Bible some other day. And so one of the things we said early on in this series is that sometimes the word disciple is also understood in the first century as apprentice. The idea of an apprentice is you, and if you've ever been an apprentice, if you've learned a trade, you understand how an apprenticeship program works, is you spend time, three or four years, with a master, someone who has their red seal, and you learn from them, and it's learning, the, the, there's the education, there's the information part, but there's also the hands-on doing, that they go hand in hand together. And at the end of the apprenticeship program, you now have your red seal, you're kind of considered a master, and you can 
You know, you, you, you've learned a trade, but you all, you're actually doing what you've learned. And when Jesus takes 12 young men and begins to teach them about the kingdom of God and what it means to live in the kingdom of God, that's what he's doing. It is an apprenticeship program. We've said uh, every first century Jewish rabbi had their understanding of the Torah, which was the first five books of the Old Testament. And they would look for students, disciples, apprentices that would learn their way and then not just gain the information, but then they would perpetuate that way of life. They would continue to live it out. They would then be the ones who live it out and hopefully teach other people to live in that way. Now, if you've ever learned something that is new or different from what you understood of how it was supposed to be done, you recognize that in learning this new way of doing something, there's one critical key thing that needs to happen. You have to surrender control. You have to let go of how you understand that this takes place. You have to let go of your way of doing it and take on the way of the teacher, the master, the rabbi. The reality is we all want to have some sense of control in our life, don't we? The reality is it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your occupation. It doesn't matter whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're not a follower of Jesus. All of us want some level of control in our lives. We want control over finances. We want control over our future, like what we're going to do. We want control over our relationships. If you're thinking, I, 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 I don't know if I, if I, you know, am that kind of person. I don't, I don't think I'm a control freak, right? Like, I don't need control. If you've ever thought or said someone doesn't get to tell you what to do, there's some level of control in you. And like I said, the vast majority of us struggle with that. We want control. We want control. And for us this morning, uh, the key that you picked up when you walked in is a symbol of our need or our desire to have control. Uh, The key that you hold in your hand is the the visual reminder that there is this element in you you that you want to have some level of control in your life. I remember uh, as a teenager, um, the first time my dad gave me the car keys, right? I didn't have a driver's license yet, but he gave me the car keys and it was, uh, it was after church and he said, go start the car. So it was winter, right? Go start the car, right? The days before there was command start, um, kids were command start. And if you don't have command start, maybe your kids are your command start. Right? It was like, dad, you go start the car. And it was just like this, wow, right? You get to hold the keys and you actually get to start the car for the very first time. Couldn't drive it, but I could start it. And, and it's like, it's one of those things, if you're a, an older sibling, right? If you're the oldest and, and, or you have younger siblings, you have this sense of like, you now have something that they don't. You have power over them because there's no way dad's giving them the keys and many of you know that um, I have a twin brother. Right? My, my younger brother is seven minutes younger than me. So that meant that the next Sunday when it was time to go start the car, the key was not given to me, it was given to my brother. Right? And now there's a battle over control between the two of us. But a key for us, I believe, symbolizes this desire that we want control. We long for control in our lives. And Jesus, in following him, when he calls us to follow him, he invites us to surrender control. Surrender is key in following Jesus. For you and I, if we are going to follow Jesus, surrender is key. There's this interesting uh, quote by Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest, and he says this, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is control. Think about that for a moment. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is control. And I think Richard Rohr has a valid point that when we hold on to control, that is the opposite of trusting Jesus and following him. 
And so this idea of surrender is, becomes, it plays itself out in a conversation that Jesus has with a, a religious leader that's recorded in Luke chapter 18. So let's turn to Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 18. Luke writes this, once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher or rabbi, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He's a religious leader. He's someone who understands the Torah. He, this is a guy who, who under, he, he's learned it. And now he's responsible for making sure that the people of Israel, the Jewish people, are following Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. God's instructions of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, what it means to be a part of the family of God. And he comes to Jesus and says, I want to know what you say, what you have to say about how we get into heaven. How do we have eternal life? And I believe ultimately the question that he's asking is, what can I do to make sure I have control of my destiny, my eternal life? I want to make sure I have control of my eternity. And maybe he's no different than many of us. Right? We, there is this sense that we want to make sure, some of it for, is that we have control of our, de- our, our future, our, our immediate future in the sense of what's going to sort of happen in the next few years. Or maybe we, when, maybe, and so we start saving up because we want to make sure that when we retire, we have enough money to retire. We want to have some level of control, but also we want to have this level of control of our destiny, our, our eternity. And so maybe for some of us, sometimes there's this, what can I do to make sure that I will spend eternity with God? Like, what is the measuring stick to make sure that you got there? Like, is the measuring stick making sure that you are better than someone else? I think sometimes we think the measuring stick is, well, as long as I'm better than my brother or my sister, like, as long as I do better than they do, or as I'm better than my neighbor, like, as long as I do, if I do more good things than my neighbor, then I'm, 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 I'm good. Or maybe the measuring stick isn't someone else. Maybe the measuring stick is just that I make sure I do more good things than I do bad things. So then, but then it becomes a question, well, is it just, do I have to just make sure that I do one good thing more than all my bad things? Like if I've done 98 bad things, I got to make sure I do 99 good things. Or maybe the me- it's not one, like, let's sort of like, let's make it 10, right? Like, let's make sure I like got to pad the, the goodness a little bit. Let's make it 10. Or is it a hundred? Or is it a thousand? How do we know we've done enough good things? Well, that's the question. Here's the response from Jesus. Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. Not only God is truly good, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Now, ultimately, Jesus' response is, okay, if you're going to if your, if your question of, of eternity is based on following the rules, just follow the Ten Commandments. Like, make sure that you obey the law. That it's that simple. And so, okay, good. Like, wait, we, we can do that, right? Maybe, right? The, the, his response is, the man replied, verse 21, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Kind of, like, so if you look at your own life, Right? And I'm going to assume that you're all good people. Right? You're, you're, you're all good people. You do good things. You, you, you strive to, to follow the rules. So when it comes to the commandments, you've got them nailed, right? Like you've, you've, you, you can check them all off. You can do the sort of the list in your own head. Of, have you always followed the law. I look at my list and I go, well, I, I've tried to, right? He seems fairly arrogant. But he's like, yeah, since I was like probably 12 or 13, like when I graduated out of the Jewish edu- um, education system, like I, I've followed them all. And it's maybe that sense of, boy, I wish I was as good as him. And then Jesus responds, verse 22, um, There is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Jesus' response is, go sell everything. 
and come follow me. Or go sell everything, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. Now, if this was you having this conversation with Jesus, what would your level of excitement be at hearing those words? Go sell everything. Go sell your car. Go sell your house. Go sell all your furniture. Sell your farm equipment. Sell everything that you hold dear in your life. Keep only one set of clothing, right? A pair of pants, a shirt, shoes, whatever you need for living the day. Keep that. But everything else, sell that. And then take the money and donate it to Silo Mission in Winnipeg. How excited would you be at hearing that this is the, the response from Jesus? Anybody jumping up for joy? Some of you are shaking your head. You're responding probably the same way this guy did. Luke's, uh, right? Jesus says, sell it all. Then Luke says, but when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. And Jesus says, sell everything, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. And his response is, he was very sad. Matthew and Mark record this story as well. And Matthew and Mark tell us that the man walked away from Jesus incredibly sad. And then again, maybe we would have the same sense because like, doesn't Jesus understand how hard I worked to, like, to earn money so that I could buy all this stuff and, and kind of like, need it to live? Like, this seems rather arrogant of Jesus to say that we should sell it all. Like, what are we supposed to do? What do we do with this encounter that this re religious leader has with Jesus? Like, it sounds like Jesus wants us to be poor. Like, Jesus is telling us we shouldn't own anything. We shouldn't have money. And Jesus isn't saying you should have no possessions and no money. Listen to how the story, what continues. When Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So then Jesus tells this, turns to his disciples and tells them this analogy. Some, some scholars argue that really Jesus is just telling a, a mini parable. It's a mini story. It's just like it's an analogy. It's not to be taken seriously, right? Because how can a camel go through the needle of an eye? Like you think of a sewing needle, right? The, like some of us have a hard enough time threading, getting thread through the eye of a needle, let alone now trying to get a camel. I don't know if it's a one hump or a two hump camel to go through this, right? Like, how is that really possible? So obviously, Jesus is just telling a story. This is just an analogy. And some have argued, well, it's, it's not just an analogy. The, the city of Jerusalem had a wall that went around it, and there were, there were gates. And so the thing is that there's this one gate. It's called the eye of the needle, and it's low and tiny. And the only way a camel could get through that, that gate is that it would have to go onto its knees and kind of, you know, crawl through the gate. Well, that's the option, right? Jesus is kind of telling the story of it. It's just really hard, but it's doable. Or the other option is that Jesus is actually saying it is easier for a full-size camel, right? Like what, how high is a tall as a camel, right? The 10 feet tall, right? Pretty wide. It is, it's easier for this massive animal to go through the eye of a needle, an actual honest sewing needle, than it is for a rich person to get into heaven. I believe, so which one is it, right? Well, I believe it's the last one. I think Jesus, I believe that Jesus is actually saying it is easier for a camel, a physically large camel, to ent go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to get into heaven. The good thing is Jesus isn't talking about when it rich people. He's not talking about you and I. Like he's talking about the people who like are really really rich, right? Like he's talking about the owner of Amazon, and like uh, Bezos, and he's talking about um, the guy who owns Tesla. And he, he's he's talking about like right. He's talking about the really really rich people, the billionaires in this world. Unfortunately, I believe that Jesus isn't talking about the billionaires of the world. 
He is talking about you and I. Because even though in comparison to many other people in the world, we are rich. We have stuff. But it's, again, this, this is not a story about stuff and money. This is a story about control. You see, the guy walks away from Jesus not because he needs, he, he's rich, but because he needs to hold on to what he has. He can't let it go. And what Jesus is saying is that when we hold on to our stuff, whether our stuff is physical in the sense that it's money or it's possessions, or we hold on to our need for control in our lives, all of us have one, at least one area in our life where we hold on to control. We, we can't get through. Like, we're too wide. It's, it's kind of like, there's, um, I don't know if you've seen this video of this hockey player leaving the ice. It's from a few years ago. Right? Um, it, it's always good that when your shining moment of your hockey career is that. Right? That that's what you become famous for. Right? The message that I believe that Jesus says is like when we hold on to control, we're too wide. We can't get through the gate. And so he's inviting us, he invites this young man, this religious leader, and he's inviting us to let go. You see, we become consumed with control. And Jesus is consumed with surrender. We're, we become consumed with control, of holding on, of making sure that we have everything right and we have everything. And Jesus is consumed with surrender, a life that is surrendered to God. The conversation pivots in Luke. Uh, verse 26, 27. Those who heard this said, then who in the world can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible for people is possible with God. In other words, like, it's impossible for us to do enough, to hold on, to, to make sure that we've done enough to get into the kingdom of heaven, to the kingdom of God. But God can do it. Like, if you trust in God, if you surrender control, you will get in. You'll get in. And then Peter said, well, we, you know, like, here's Peter, he's, we've left our homes to follow you. Like, hey, like, we, we gave up everything, right? Like, we're good, right? We, um, and Jesus replied, verse 29, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. So it might sound like what Jesus is saying is like, if you give up everything to follow Jesus, you'll get way more in return. And it kind of becomes this prosperity message of, like, if you really want to be blessed by God, you should give up everything because God will give you way more in return. And that's not what Jesus is saying. For Jesus, it's not about, like, if we're consumed with how good we are, we've lost the point. The point Jesus is making is this is all about control and the surrender of control. Can we let go of control over the one thing in our life? Can we let go of control of the one thing in our life that we hold important? That we hold important. The story is told about the Knights Templar. I don't know if you know who the Knights Templar are. Uh, they were, the Knights Templar were a Catholic military order during the Middle Ages. And they were among the most skilled fighters during the, the Crusades of sort of around 1000 and 1100 um, AD. And legend has it, there, there's no way of knowing if this is actually true. Just, this is just the legend, the story that goes with the Knights Templar, is that when the, the, the Knights Templar soldiers would head off into battle, they would be baptized before they would leave for battle in their full uniform. And as they would be dunked under water, they would take their sword and they would hold their sword up out of the water because they, they didn't want to baptize their sword. And the reason was not because they were afraid that the water would end up to corroding the metal and they would destroy, make the, wet, the, the metal weak and, and therefore they wouldn't be able to, to fight there in battle and win. It was because they, under, they understood that they might do some things with their sword that would not honor Jesus. And so they would baptize themselves but not their sword. They'd keep their sword out of the water. What is the one thing that we hold out that we're like, I'll surrender everything but this. 
right? And again, the key symbolizes the one thing in our life that we hold on to that we can't let go of. For the religious leader, it was wealth and his possessions. Maybe for some of us, the thing that we hold on to, yeah, it, it's like, I just, I just, I, my bank account, my property, like that's what I hold. That's the most important thing for me. I got to hold on to that. Jesus has no, no say into that. Or maybe it's a relationship. It, there's, there's a relationship that we have and there's no way Jesus is speaking into that relationship. Maybe there's, it's your future and, 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 and Jesus is saying, listen, I want, I want you to, your career, your life path to go in this direction. And we're like, nah, like if I go that way, I can't, like I'm not going to, have the, the opportunities of, of income and retirement that I, if I go this way, like I, I, I want to hold on to control in my life. But all of us have something that we will struggle to hold on to, that we'll fight to hold on to. So this is what we're going to do with the key. And there's another story that goes with the key. Um, I'm told that when ships travel through the Panama Canal, there is an exchanging of keys that take place. Uh, as the ship is coming up to the canal, the captain of the ship holds the keys. But the captain is not allowed to navigate the ship through the canal. Uh, there's a canal pilot or captain that has to do that. And so that canal captain comes onto the ship. And when the canal captain comes onto the ship, the sh captain of the ship hands the keys over to the canal captain. And the canal captain now is responsible for navigating the ship through the canal. He's got to surrender the keys. And when Jesus invites us to follow him, the invitation for us to follow him is that we surrender the keys of our life. You and I are invited to surrender the keys. So I want you to take your key. I want you to sort of hold it in your hand. Feel the weight of it. You can kind of make, you know, most of them should have, like, these are reject keys from somewhere. Most of them actually are from co-op here in town. So this may belong to one of you originally. I don't know. Right? But feel the weight of it. Feel the edges. What is the one thing in your life that you fight to hold on to control of? What is that one place? Is it money? Is it possessions? Is it a relationship? Is it your future? What is the one thing that Jesus is inviting you to surrender to him? Because Jesus invites us to let go of control to give it to him. This is what we're going to do this morning. We're going to celebrate communion. And uh, we're going to celebrate by coming to the front 